Evangelism can mean nothing else than proclaiming Jesus Christ to persuade men to become his disciples and responsible members of his church. October 2010, after five years of preparation, the third Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization is set to begin in Cape Town, South Africa. It's potentially the beginning of a new era in the strategic spread of the gospel across the world. Grant us a fresh vision of yourself, a vision for the church, and a vision for the world. The convention center is filled with people who are leaders, who are people who are visionaries. Many, many people here know what it means to have a vision, to have a dream, and then begin to think about it, talk with others about it, to plant the seed here and there, and then to see what God might do with it. You have come so far to be here. Welcome to Africa. I'm from Nepal. From Thailand. I'm uh, coming from Croatia. I come from Belgium and I work there with students. I'm amazed at how many people are represented here from my, how many countries. This third Lausanne Congress has already been described as the most representative and diverse gathering of Christian leaders in the nearly 2,000 year history of the Christian movement. I am Evangelist Robinson Asker and I'm from Pakistan. I'm Bishop Daniel Boku from Nigeria. I'm from uh, Tokyo, Japan. And I'm from Egypt. We're a delegation of 20 that come from Guatemala. I'm really, really grateful to have been invited to come. I am tremendously thrilled to be here. It's all the happening. And you guys being with us, thank you. We are joined tonight and this week by over 100,000 people at nearly 700 Global Link sites in 96 countries of the world. And I'm here to discover what God is doing all over the world. Today, only 32% of the participants here come from the Western world. 68% come from the non-Western world. That's an indicator of the growth of the church in the South. What people are seeing, they are seeing the global church. They are no longer seeing a, a Western church sending out missionaries, but they are seeing a global church uh, with a challenge to the whole church to take responsibility for global missions. But one delegation from the global church is missing. Throughout most of the 20th century, the Chinese church has exploded in numbers despite the tensions and challenges it has faced over the last hundred years. 200 delegates were planning to attend the Congress, but no one was able to leave the country. Demonstrating that the mission of the church faces a variety of challenges on its many frontiers. I received a note from the person who has been providing leadership for the group from all across China. And he said, we accept the decision quietly and with hope. Thank you for the many there in Cape Town who will be praying for us in many languages. Our brothers and sisters in China have also prepared for us a song that they were eager to sing in our presence, but they have sent us the words and the music for the song, The Lord's Love for China. Although the absence of the Chinese is keenly felt, those thousands of church leaders who have arrived from across the world are excited by the opportunity to gather as a global community, for such experiences are rare and very influential. Edinburgh, Scotland, exactly 100 years before the Congress in Cape Town, 
1,200 Christian leaders, mainly from North America and Northern Europe, came here to hold a conference on world evangelization that energized many missionary activities throughout the 20th century. In the 100 years since 1910, church leaders from across the world have gathered several times to address the evangelistic issues of the day. In a landmark congress in Berlin in 1966, Dr. John Stott challenged the church to renew its belief and commitment to the truth of the gospel, and it spread throughout the world. The greatest single reason for the church's evangelistic disobedience is to be found in the church's doubts. And so because we doubt, we are dumb. Lausanne, Switzerland, 1974. The location of the historic Congress convened by Dr. Billy Graham, in which the groundswell of support for a clear, strategic approach to evangelism was galvanized into a movement. Our calling is to a specific sector of the church's responsibility, evangelism. And so the Lausanne movement was born. A second Lausanne Congress was held in Manila, Philippines in 1989. Out of it came hundreds of evangelical partnerships. Lausanne is a catalyst to mobilize people to engage in communicating the gospel of Christ. We want to bring together deep theological reflection on guiding principles in scripture together with praxis and application. And so to Cape Town, an ethnically diverse jewel washed by the waters of the southern oceans and set against the unique grandeur of Table Mountain. But the 4,200 Christian leaders from 198 countries come also to a spiritual table with no less a subject on their minds than the evangelization of the whole world. They evangelize uh, the, the, the whole continent and make disciples of all. Better and deeper understanding how to reach this fast-changing world. We are united by one single purpose, to see Jesus glorified around the world through the joint effort of his church. And see what the issues are in our day uh, and uh, how we are to address them uh, with the gospel. It's about communicating the gospel message of Jesus Christ and our whole purpose as a Congress has been simply to serve the world church, bringing people together, organizing an event, so that we could look at how do we more effectively, under God, in greater humility and purity, communicate this message. The practicalities of organizing a Congress on this scale are vast and depend on many hundreds of volunteers as well as a great variety of professional services. Approximately 72,000 meals in total. We have full-time 120 chefs working 24 hours a day producing these meals. We got to work with their visas, the immunization, uh, the air travel, telecommodation. All of that happens before they get here. We have 300 stewards here from over 30 different countries. I got an email saying, would you consider being a steward? And I just was so blessed. I'm a steward. I'm also serving as a pastor in New York City, Harlem, New York to be exact. I am from Bangalore, south of India. The thing is, my God, my Jesus, he came as master of all, but he became servant of all. To see the brotherhood and to see that the spirit in Christ really unites us is, is great. We're out in the marshalling yard behind the, the area where the plenary sessions take place, and it's a gathering of mobile trailers, the uh, television production truck, and uh, a lot of people that most never see who are working uh, early and late to bring all these parts together to uh, produce the final product that's shown around the rest of the world. Among the most complex challenges for a Congress with a worldwide audience is communication. Which means all aspects of communications, digital, print, uh, broadcast, television and radio, the uh, daily news sheet that we've handed out here, and anything else having to do with communications. We're networking people together, and we're also encouraging these people to develop relationships and friendships with each other. Essential to those partnerships and those networks is really communication. We have a press center with uh, 100 credentialed media and daily press conference, so we have a team of 120 people on site and another 100, 130 off site, all involved just to pull off the communi communications part of this. 
and yet another challenging dimension, linking over 650 remote sites directly to the Congress through Global Link. The first thing that happens is that, that all of the, the main sessions are recorded. They move from the production truck to about five video editing suites that each have about 10 people in them that take the plenary sessions, divide them up into 12 minute segments and prepare them to move out into the web and in locations around the world. There are six teams of writers that are working around the clock to, to write synopsis and study questions for each one of the video segments. The Congress program was carefully structured to give prominence to the study of scripture and to wrestle with the issues for evangelism in the 21st century. It is a deeply theological prayer and it's describing gospel theology. But the thing about this theology was that it was theology on fire. Paul was excited about this gospel. Plenary One was designed to be a celebration of the Bible, and we wanted to motivate the global church to really embrace the scripture and take it in mission at every level. As God did in the beginning, God again grants humankind purpose. Verse 10. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. We wanted to create a space where we could hear from God together, uh, particularly through Ephesians, asking God, what do you want to say to the global church at this time? When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So those two things, preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and make known the mystery which God has kept secret for ages but is now revealing. Now why? Why are those two things to be preached? We dreamed. And one of our dreams was to make things different, that we need to be unique in the way we do things. So the very fact that we have gotten six different Bible expositors, I don't think it's ever been done, that people have gotten together to plan how they're going to preach at the Congress. We put barriers up. We imply that you're only really welcome if you're exactly like us. And Paul says, now be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. We thought of God's uh, cosmic integration of people in a new humanity in Christ. We're thinking about ethnic unity, ecclesial unity, and it's all because of the gospel of reconciliation of us to God and of us to one another. So it's a wonderful biblical gospel mission message, I think, that is coming through. The onus is on us to rise against the grain and the trend of our cultural moments. To be able to make an impact, we need to be different, for indeed we are different. We believe in Jesus. We are seated in the heavenly places in Christ. We are no longer aliens but the children of God. We are a new creation. We live a life of fullness in the spirit of the living God. Therefore, let us truly walk as a different people in the world today. For thus we have been called. Even the Apostle Paul needed the prayers of Christians to be able to withstand when he was in prison and was being tempted and had such difficulty. We wanted to model outstanding expository preaching as well as model small group inductive Bible study. In the small group uh, table groups, they are discussing the text before the speaker speaks and, and learning things before even the, the expositor said anything. So they were interacting with God's Word. I keep thanking for that brought me here and this morning for the study of Ephesians, I learned a lot. To remember um, what he's done for us. That story, our story, personal stories, are very important to us always remembering the gift that God has given us. The Global Church came to Cape Town to wrestle with major challenges for evangelism, but they were helpfully organized within three overarching ideas. We're dealing two days each with the whole church, the whole gospel, the whole world. In this case, the first two days were dedicated to the whole gospel. Resulting from a worldwide consultation, a key issue was identified for each day. Six main challenges to world evangelization, and we wanted to highlight one of those issues each day. Truth, reconciliation, world faiths, priorities, integrity, and partnership. 
truth being so fundamentally important is the priority for day one. There are all sorts of subtle ways in which evangelicals have become soft on truth. And to the degree we're soft on truth, we're not faithful to the gospel, and we're courting decline and eventually spiritual suicide. Too often truth is left as a philosophical issue. Philosophical issues are important to us, but truth is first and foremost a matter of theology. In the secular world, truth is sometimes believed to be merely a matter of opinion. The Congress faced up to the challenge. In Asia, as much as it is in the West, people believe that truth is relative. What is true to you may not be true to me. Okay? But we Christians believe that truth is objective and absolute. And that truth means Jesus Christ. A further major challenge to the communication of Christian truth is the rising influence of an atheistic worldview, as was demonstrated to the Congress by an extract from a new major television series called The God Question, in which theists and atheists clash over the evidence for the existence of God. Religion is by far the single most dangerous threat to the search for truth. Religion asks you to believe in a whole sort of collection of absurdities. I think that faith is a good thing in itself, a, a superior, morally superior to reason. The children grow up with an atheist mindset, thinking that faith and church do not matter to their lives at all. They have thus no detailed knowledge anymore about faith, no practice in prayer, and absolutely no idea of a different world that surrounds us with a loving God. We simply have to come back to Jesus himself and to the way in which he was and is the truth. Our Lord is the God of truth, and because of that, his word is truth and he may be trusted and our whole existence staked on him. We can only prove to the world that Jesus is the truth by his transformative power in our life. Our broken world and how to bring reconciliation to it was the issue for day two of Cape Town 2010. Coming from across the world, the participants are familiar with the pain and many are already involved in the Ministry of Reconciliation. I come from the country of Rwanda and uh, as everybody knows, in the year 1994 our country went through a genocide that took a million people in a hundred days. In our country, in Serbia, we have a few hundred thousand refugees from uh, Bosnia, Croatia and Kosovo. People have been kicked out of their homes, sometimes even families falling apart. The pain is very deep. Go visit Bethlehem, uh, come visit Nazareth, and just by looking at the people, looking at their faces, seeing how much um, despair people stopped having hope. In a world where there is so much pain and suffering, people struggle to believe that God is good. I want to share with you some of the brokenness of our world that leads to this disbelief in God's goodness but also share the hope of how God reveals His goodness in the midst of suffering. The brokenness that uh, uh, we are associated with and we are dealing with is uh, the broken people. I mean, and these are the Dalits. The word Dalit itself means broken, crushed, totally smashed, pounded, exploited, oppressed. Jesus has put me in the Ministry of Reconciliation, preaching Christ and converting people and transforming nations. I have decided to dedicate my life to the work of Musalaha to pursue and promote reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians. Because in the Messiah, there is room for all of us. He calls us to be one family. I am really truly amazed at how the power of God is able to work in the lives of people, especially this morning when I watch how a Palestinian Christian and also an Israeli Christian who are able to see, uh, you know, eye and eye with one another. What struck me quite powerfully was the three bits about peace and Jesus. Jesus 
is our peace, he makes peace and he preaches peace. Kill hostility, I think that was the line that really struck out. Not just diminish it or decrease it, but to kill it. Right now I'm tweeting to my community about what happened at the morning conference. It was very moving to hear from Rwanda, from um, Palestine, from these places of great uh, violence and conflict. And um, so I'm just repeating some of the most powerful lines that affected me. Antoine Rutaiseri, he said, we as a church have to take responsibility if our communities remain full of um, bitterness and hatred, which is quite powerful. All of it was to prepare for the discussions around the table groups, because really the heart of Plenary II was the discussion between the participants around those tables of six. Hearing issues of reconciliation that have gone on between some issues affecting our countries in the past, uh, it's been very good. There's a couple of things. I've got a to-do list that I've uh, written of the things that I want to input when I'm back. Number one uh, thing is the issue of reconciliation. In diffusing them into small groups, they were able, the, the Holy Spirit had an opportunity to work in their hearts and many, many stories of God touching people's hearts, making them more tender, making them more open, more vulnerable, and willing to learn from others. So that happened in a remarkable way. Retaining the idea of the fellowship around the tables was, uh, was one of the key components uh, so that we can foster uh, micro communities that are representative of the global church. Okay, who can I contact? Who can I write? Somebody the issue for each day was always multidimensional. So in the early afternoon, participants were offered so-called multiplex options, where one aspect of the issue could be unraveled and discussed in more detail. The multiplex is that part of the program that we did in the afternoon where we took the six major themes of the con Congress and then we divided them into 24 minor subjects. Now that then led into the dialogue sessions where groups of anywhere from 30 to 50 people could meet to really interact around the big six themes of the Congress. We wanted a deeper comprehension of what are the big issues in God's global mission today. Uh, second one, we wanted to work on contextualization. We wanted to move from the global and get to the local. And then the third word was commitment. Now, we're, we're trusting the Spirit of God for people then to take that knowledge contextually and now would apply it as they leave the Congress. The Congress is fully underway, but suddenly all global and internet dependent services are disrupted. It was a perfect storm for the communications team. Those were the really long and stressful days. We can never foresee everything and we just ultimately have to trust that God's purposes will be, be accomplished. The solution lay with two stewards who had come for a very different purpose. We didn't know that they had computer expertise, they just came to serve in whatever capacity. Top leaders in their field as it relates to IT, they were able to help us meet a need. You know, and that was, that was something that God organized. Day three dawns, and with the technical challenges of the previous day receding, the Congress moves forward in its global agenda. On the third day, we move from the matter of the gospel to the matter of the world, and we dealt with people of other faiths. It is maybe a sad reflection that for some of us, we spend our lives looking for models of evangelism and discipleship that cost nothing. But such a gospel would not be recognized by the early apostles as a genuine gospel. In my home country, I could be arrested for it. The people that I'm reaching out to has been neglected for so long, and they need Jesus just as much as anyone else. I've lost a classmate who was a pastor in Kaduna. He was roasted in his church. I've lost colleagues, schoolmates, and brothers and sisters who've been slaughtered for the faith. Why I'm alive, I don't know. But one thing I know, until my time is up, until that day, I have a gospel to proclaim. I have a gospel worth living for, and I have a gospel worth dying for. Amen. God has chosen that some of His servants be imprisoned as a way of bringing about His cosmic purpose. Verse 1, verse 13. I am from Eritrea, a country in East Africa. Uh, where uh, persecution is very severe right now. The church leaders, most of them, they are in jail. There are truly no closed countries to the gospel. There are only places where we are not prepared to stand up for the gospel. I was born a Muslim. But in a most dynamic and dramatic way, Jesus entered my life and my orthodox, conservative, 
practicing Muslim husband also came to the Lord. To remember that the gospel is worth dying for, that Jesus is real, and that we can take him to places where people are afraid to go. This morning, uh, session is very powerful. Uh, it's like, uh, uh, you know, preaching the gospel, we have to count the cost and we have to suffer for the sake of Christ. I was a missionary kid in Brazil and my mother died shortly after my brother was born when I was only two. After John Piper spoke about the cost of discipleship, I finally understood, not in my head, but in my heart, that it was worth it for me to be without a mother for 50 years for the, for the, for the gospel. Last uh, night, I received a call from my wife uh, back home that our church in Rawalpindi, Islamabad, RCDM Church, Gordon College Chapel was attacked by the fundamentalist and the property mafia and taken over my ministry office. Well, I have found myself, along with many others, deeply emotionally stirred uh, at the stories of suffering, uh, at the stories of people who have come from backgrounds of other faiths through the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are then led through suffering into ways in which they demonstrate the power of God. This is not orchestrated as an inspirational gathering, though it is, it is inspirational. It's really meant to deal with substantive issues. We're, 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 we're wrestling with them, we're grappling with them. And so too are hundreds of Global Link sites across the world. Greetings from Elmbrook Church in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Greetings from Albania. Welcome to Gloucester in the United Kingdom. We're thrilled to be one of 700 Global Link sites connecting with Cape Town 2010. Today we feel a great joy and privilege that after such a long time of isolation, we are now able to participate in this Congress. Will you join us in the middle of the discussions we're having as part of the global conversation? We've been discussing Ephesians 1. The hope and vision of Global Link sites is a world interconnection that will study the, the key issues of this our day and then be able to mobilize to make a difference in the world. On day four, the Congress continued to focus on the world. Today we're dealing with priorities for mission in a 21st century globalized world. We want to talk about what we need to do differently in the body of Christ to see the Great Commission accomplished and disciples made in every nation. The theme of my message is the unreached and unengaged people groups of northern part of India. Where is the church not? Where is the church not present? And what are we going to do about it? If you want human life as it is lived in this world to be shaped at all by Jesus Christ, you have to, we have to go to the city. All Christians believe in the gospel, but not all Christians believe in the urgency of the gospel. Just as the gospel needs to be heard in native languages, so does the message of the Congress. We have 28 full-time interpreters who are interpreting from English into the seven conference languages. And you've seen them there in the booths, just talking and talking and talking so that the participants can experience the content of the conference in their own languages. So we're now two-thirds of the way through the major themes for the Congress. The next two days, we'll deal with the church. There are self-appointed super apostles and mighty elevated leaders, unaccountable to anybody else. That's the idolatry of pride and power. Calling the church to a, a 21st century reformation to authenticity, which would be characterized by humility and integrity and simplicity. Integrity, well, doing what is right and definitely being honest and having all those values that Christ taught us. Integrity means wholeness. Everything being together, what everything is together, it's not compromised. We do what we say, and what we say we do. Evangelical Christians worldwide have a great deal to be ashamed of. There's a great deal of practices going on which need reformation and need change. And there is a craze for success and for results and obsession with statistics and outcomes. That's the idolatry of success. And then there's the so-called prosperity gospel. This gospel makes the pursuit of material things end in themselves. I suggest that in whatever way we ourselves have aligned with this gospel, we need to repent. It is my prayer 
that really everybody takes this on board. On day six, on Sunday, we will deal with uh, global partnerships or developing a new global equilibrium. Yeah, so I believe partnerships, uh, biblically speaking, are uh, necessary. Humanly speaking, are challenging. I think that the Lord gave me the opportunity to lead the Ibero-American Mission Cooperation. That is a, it's a partnership between uh, 27 different countries in Latin America. And we have been working them to try to sit together and realize that it is possible to do mission if we learn to work together. The partnership that we see that the church still needs to improve in it's in the partnership of males and females working together based on any gifts that God gives them. So we want to encourage people to use the gifts for the purpose of uh, reaching all the unreached people groups and completing the Great Commission. I would like to see brothers and sisters, churches from the global church, from north, from the south, the east and the west, the old and the young, the men and women, all generations, to bring the gospel to the world. We have a huge task before us to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth and we can only do it if we do it together using all the gifts that God has given to men and to women. Men and women living and serving God in harmony is what God had intended. Men and women created in the image of God, created to be partners in this world. I became more deeply convinced than ever of how critically important each of these six issues was. And I think one of my greatest hopes is that those, that dis substantial discussion of those issues will take place in each of the regions, in each of the countries from which the participants came. One of the objectives of the Congress is to make a very clear statement about evangelical convictions and beliefs entitled the Cape Town Commitment. Uh, a series of evangelical affirmations, what we believe, followed by a call to evangelical action. Part one of the commitment was built around the theme of love for God. Uh, part two of the commitment was built around the six Congress themes. I hope that the Cape Town Confession of Faith will serve a number of churches, perhaps denominations or agencies or just ordinary individual Christians, uh, as a way of expressing and encapsulating the core of their faith. And on the other hand, I hope that it will provide something of a, a roadmap, a way of saying here is a kind of agenda for the church moving into the future. But the fresh commitment to evangelism has already begun. Inspired by the coming of Cape Town 2010, Mission Africa has already been spreading across the continent. Mission Africa is a vision which became born through a number of us thinking about what should precede the Congress and what might flow out from it. We've brought together African and non-Western evangelists to work in partnership, leading uh, citywide missions in 15 cities across the continent. So that the Congress wasn't just an isolated event, but was part of a whole evangelistic uh, thrust and process. Half a million people came to the meetings, about 50,000 professed faith, they engaged both in public evangelism and ministries of compassion. The coming generation who is uh, longing for vision and refreshments and who can be really uh, fueled by the energy that is coming from this Lausanne movement. And even during the Congress, the energizing of a new generation is beginning, as demonstrated by these young participants from Norway, who from Cape Town 2010 have created a website to encourage evangelism in their own country. We need a new generation that is prepared to fulfill the Great Commission, that is prepared to participate in fulfilling the Great Commission. So with this uh, website we want to inspire, inform and involve young people in Norway in missions. With the arrival of each evening in Cape Town, participants assembled for Plenary 3 to recognize how God is on the move. Our theme has been every evening, God on the move. May we walk away tonight as the church on the move. There was celebration, up-to-date information about the church in a region of the world, a chance to reflect on major opportunities for evangelism such as the diaspora, people on the move, or learn from the perseverance of those who are persecuted for their faith. I was born in Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. There my parents came to know the amazing grace and love of God. 
My father was sentenced to prison. It breaks my heart to tell you that I have heard no word from my father nor about him ever since. In all probability, he has been shot to death in public on charges of treason in North Korea. Even before the Congress has ended, the work of evangelism is yielding spiritual fruit. I'm here to serve as a steward. On Tuesday, we had an opportunity to speak to two uh, security guards that are serving alongside. And we shared the love of Christ concerning why we're here and what we're doing. And that led to these two young men giving their lives to Christ, making commitments. As the Congress nears its conclusion, minds are focusing on outcomes and the way ahead. As leadership in South Africa, we've already planned a meeting in July, which will be a follow-up to this. And the plan about that meeting is to say, now that the Congress was here, now that we were challenged to take the gospel to the whole of South Africa, to the whole of the world, how then do we do that practically? Because of this conference, there is going to be an increase in the spreading of the gospel across the world. And I think people have been called to a new sense of commitment. I'm going home and I have so much um, energy and motivation and thoughts on different things that, can, that I should be Thank doing. You very much. One of the things that I want to do is to see that uh, mega cities of India can be reached. Part of my desire to be involved with uh, social justice in the diasporic communities is to really be able to uh, help fight for those who are abused, part of the human trafficking. I'm really hoping and praying that this will not result in us just going back home and going back to doing what we've been doing all the time. I am hoping for change. So this conference has really helped, helped me to see uh, how best I can reach the unreached people. Uh, in my country there are so many people who have not heard the gospel. And so to the conclusion of the Congress, but in reality only the end of the beginning of a new momentum in world evangelization. We believe that the many gifts that we have seen displayed in the plenaries, in the discussions, has literally impacted us and given us new vision. I think some of the, 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 the best that's yet to come out of Lausanne won't even be known to us. I think it's going to encourage many people to, you know, with fresh strength to uh, take the gospel further on. From Cape Town, God has put a deposit in us, and that deposit ought to be shared back home. I feel very strongly that this will actually unleash a whole new wave of initiative for the work of global mission in the coming generation. As you seek to bear witness to Christ, with God's help, Wesley wrote, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can, till Christ takes you home. God bless you.